Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you'll be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a member of the YouTube channel and or become a Patreon and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 12 The Parable of the Gem Traitor Revealed Taz's Dilemma Stop that, you bold man, Caraman simpered, slapping Eben's hand as the fighter slyly slid his hand up Caraman's skirt. The women in the room laughed so heartily at the antics of the two warriors that Tannis gr glanced nervously at the cell door, afraid of arousing the suspicion of the guards. Marita saw his worried gaze. Don't worry about the guards, she said with a shrug. There are only two down here on this level, and they're drunk half the time especially now that the army's moved out. She looked up from her sewing at the women and shook her head. It does my heart good to hear them laugh, poor things, she said softly. They've had little enough to laugh about these past days. Thirty-four women were crowded into one cell. Marita said there were sixty women living in another nearby, under conditions so shocking that even the hardened campaigners were appalled. Rude straw mats covered the floor. The women had no possessions beyond a few clothes. They were allowed outdoors for a brief exercise period each morning. The rest of the time they were forced to sew draconian uniforms. Though they had been imprisoned only a few weeks, their faces were pale and wan, their bodies thin and gaunt from the lack of nourishing food. Tannis relaxed. Though he had known Marita only a few hours, he already relied on her judgment. She was the one who had calmed the terrified women when the companions burst into their cells. She was the one who listened to their plan and agreed that it had possibilities. Our men folk will go along with you, she told Tannis. It's the High Seekers who will give you trouble. The Council of High Seekers, Tannis asked in astonishment. They're here, prisoners. Marita nodded, frowning. That was their payment for believing in that black cleric. But they won't want to leave. And why should they? They're not forced to work in the mines. The Dragon High Lord sees to that. But we're with you. She glanced around at the others who nodded firmly, on one condition, that you'll not put the children in danger. I can't guarantee that, Tennis said. I don't mean to sound harsh, but we may have to fight a dragon to reach them and... Fight a dragon? Flame strike? Marita looked at him in amazement. Pah, there's no need to fight the pitiful critter. In fact... Were you to hurt her, she'd have half the children ready to tear you apart. They're that fond of her. Of a dragon, Goldmoon asked. What's she done, cast a spell on them? No, I doubt Flamestrike could cast a spell on anything anymore, Marita smiled sadly. The poor critter's more than half mad. Her own children were killed in some great war or other, and now she's got it in her head that our children are her children. I don't know where his lordship dug her up, but it was a sorry thing to do, and I hope he pays for it some day. She snapped a thread viciously. "'Twon't be difficult to free the children,' she added, seeing Tannis's worried look. "'Flamestrike always sleeps late on a morning. We, freed the, "'We feed the children their breakfast, take them out for their exercise, and she never stirs. "'She'll never know they're gone till she wakes, poor thing.' The women, filled with hope for the first time, began nodding, modifying old clothes to fit the men. Things went smoothly until it came time to fit them. Shave, Sturm roared in such fury that the women scurried away from the night in alarm. Sturm had taken a dim view of the disguise idea anyway, but he had agreed to go along with it. It seemed the best way to cross the wide open courtyard between the fortress and the mines, but, he announced, he would rather die a hundred deaths at the hands of the Dragon High Lord than shave his mustaches. His only calm, he only calmed down when Tannis suggested covering his face with a scarf. Just when that was settled, another crisis arose. 
Riverwind stated flatly that he would not dress up as a woman and no amount of arguing could convince him otherwise. Goldmoon finally took Tannis aside to explain that, in their tribe, any warrior who committed a cowardly act in battle was forced to wear women's clothes until he redeemed himself. Tannis was baffled by this one, but Marita had wondered how they would manage to outfit the tall man anyway. After much discussion, it was decided Riverwind would bundle up in a long cloak and walk hunched over, leaning on a staff like an old woman. Things went smoothly after this, for a time at least. Lorana walked over to a corner of the room where Tannis was wrapping a scarf around his own face. Why don't you shave, Lorana asked, staring at Tannis's beard, or do you truly enjoy flaunting your human side as Gilthana says? I don't flaunt it, Tannis replied evenly. I just got tired of trying to deny it, that's all. He drew a deep breath. Lorana, I'm sorry I spoke to you as I did back in the Sla Mori. I had no right. You had every right, Lorana interrupted. What I did was the act of a lovesick little girl. I foolishly endangered your lives. Her voice faltered, then she regained control. It will not happen again. I will prove I can be of value to the group. Exactly how she meant to do this, she wasn't certain. Although she talked glibly about being skilled in fighting, she had never killed so much as a rabbit. She was so frightened now that she was forced to clasp her hands around her back to keep Tennis from seeing how she trembled. She was afraid that if she let herself, she would give way to her weakness and seek comfort in his arms. So she left him and went over to help Gilthanus with his disguise. Tennis told himself he was glad Lorana was showing some signs of maturity at last. He steadfastly refused to admit that his soul stood breathless whenever he looked into her large, luminous eyes. The afternoon passed swiftly and soon it was evening and time for the women to take dinner to the mines. The companions waited for the guards to intense silence, laughter forgotten. There had, after all, been one last crisis. Raislin, coughing until he was exhausted, said he was too weak to accompany them. When his brother offered to stay behind with him, Raislin glared at him irritably and told him not to be a fool. You do not need me this night, the mage whispered. Leave me alone, I must sleep. I don't like leaving him there, Gilthanus began, but before he could continue, he heard the sound of clawed feet outside the cell and another sound of pots rattling. The cell door swung open and two draconian guards, both smelling strongly of stale wine, stepped inside. One of them reeled a bit as it peered, bleary-eyed at the women. Get moving, it said harshly. As the women filed out, they saw six gully dwarfs standing in the corridor, lugging large pots of some sort of nameless stew. Caraman sniffed hungrily, then wrinkled his nose in disgust. The draconian slammed the cell door shut behind them. Glancing back, Caraman saw his twin, shrouded in blankets, lying in a dark, shadowy corner. Fizzbane clapped his hands. Well done, my boy, said the old magician in excitement as part of the wall and the mechanism room swung open. Thanks, Taz replied modestly. Actually, finding the secret door was more difficult than opening it. I don't know how you managed. I thought I'd looked everywhere. He started to crawl through the door, then stopped as a thought occurred to him. Fizban, is there any way you can tell that light of yours to stay behind? At least until we see if anyone's in here. Otherwise, I'm going to make an awfully good target and we're not far from Verminard's chambers. I'm afraid not, Fizban shook his head. It doesn't like to be left alone in dark places. Tasselhoff nodded. He had expected the answer. Well, there was no use worrying about it. If the milk spilled, the cat will drink it, as his mother used to say. Fortunately, the narrow hallway he crawled into appeared empty. The flame hovered near his shoulder. He helped Fizban through, then explored his surroundings. There was a small hallway that ended abruptly not forty feet away in a flight of stairs descending into darkness. Double bronze doors in the east wall provided the only other exit. Now, muttered Taz, we're above the throne room... Those stairs probably lead down to it. I suppose there's a million draconians guarding it, so that's out. He put his ear to the door. No sound. Let's look around. Pushing gently, he easily opened the double doors. 
Pausing to listen, Taz entered cautiously, followed closely by Fizban in the puffball flame. Some sort of art gallery, he said, glancing around a giant room where paintings covered with dust and grime hung on the walls. High slit windows in the walls gave Taz a glimpse of the stairs and the tops of high mountains. With a good idea of where he was now, he drew a crude map in his head. If my calculations are correct, the throne room is to the west, and the dragon's lair is to the west of that. At least, that's where he went when Verminard left this afternoon. The dragon must have some way to fly out of this building, so the lair should open up to the sky, which means a shaft of some sort, and maybe another crack where we can see what's going on. So involved was Taz with his plans that he was not paying any attention to Fizban. The old magician was moving purposefully around the room, studying each painting as if searching for one in particular. Ah, here it is, Fizban murmured, then turned and whispered, Tasselhoff! The kender lifted his head and saw the painting suddenly begin to glow with a soft light. Look at that, Tasselhoff said entranced. Why, it's a painting of dragons. Red dragons like Ember, attacking Pox Tharkas, and... The kender's voice died. Men, knights of Salomnia, mounted on other dragons, were fighting back. The dragons, the knights rode, were beautiful dragons, gold and silver dragons, and the men carried bright weapons that gleamed with a shining radiance. Suddenly, Tasselhoff understood. There were good dragons in the world, if they could be found, who would help fight the evil dragons, and there was... The dragon lance, he murmured. The old magician nodded to himself. Yes, little one, he whispered. You understand. You see the answer. And you will remember. But not now. Not now. Reaching out, he ruffled the kinder's hair with his gnarled hand. Dragons, what was I saying? Taz couldn't remember. And what he was he doing here anyhow, staring at a painting so covered with dust he couldn't make it out? The kinder shook his head. Fizban must be rubbing off on him. Oh yes, the dragon's lair. If my calculations are correct, it's over here. He walked away. The old magician shuffled along behind, smiling. The companion's journey to the mines proved uneventful. They saw only a few draconian guards and they appeared half asleep with boredom. No one paid any attention to the women going by. They passed the glowing forge, continually fed by a scrambling mass of exhausted gully dwarves. Hurrying past that dismal sight quickly, the companions entered the mines where draconian guards locked the men in huge cave rooms at night, then returned to keep an eye on the gully dwarves. Guard duty was over the men was a waste of time. Anyway, Verminard figured, the humans weren't going any place. And for a while, it looked to Tennis as if this might prove horribly true. The men weren't going any place. They stared at Goldmoon, unconvinced, as she spoke. After all, she was a barbarian. Her accent was strange, her dress even stranger. She told what seemed a children's tale of a dragon dying in a blue flame she herself survived, and all she had to show for it was a collection of shining platinum discs. Hedrick the Solace Theocrat was loud in his denunciation of the Kyushu woman as a witch and a charlatan and a blasphemer. He reminded them of the scene in the inn, exhibited his scarred hand as evidence. Not that the men paid a great deal of attention to Hedrick. The seeker gods, after all, had not kept the dragons from solace. Many of them, in fact, were interested in the prospect of escape. Nearly all bore some mark of ill treatment, whiplashes, bruised faces. They were poorly fed, forced to live in conditions of filth and squalor, and everyone knew that when the iron beneath the hills was gone... Their usefulness to Lord Verminard would end. But the High Seekers, still the governing body, even in prison, opposed such a reckless plan. Arguments started. The men shouted back and forth. Tennis hastily posted Caraman Flint, Eben Sturm, and Gilthanus at the doors, fearing the guards would hear the disturbance in return. The half-elf hadn't expected this. The arguing might last for days. Goldmoon sat despondently before the men, looking as though she might cry. 
She had been so imbued with her newfound convictions and so eager to bring her knowledge to the world that she was cast into despair when her beliefs were doubted. These humans are fools, Lorana said softly, coming up to stand beside Tannis. No, replied Tannis, sighing. If they were fools, it would be easier. We promised them nothing tangible and asked them to risk the only thing they have left, their lives. And for what? To flee into the hills, fighting a running battle all the way. At least here they are alive, for the time being. But how can life be worth anything living like this? Lorana asked. That's a very good question, young woman, said a feeble voice. They turned to see Merida kneeling beside a man lying on a crude cot in a corner of the cell. Wasted with illness and deprivation, his age was indeterminable. He struggled to sit up, stretching out a thin, pale hand to Tannis and Lorana. His, bre his breath rattled in his chest. Mata Merida tried to hush him, but he stared at her irritably. I know I'm dying, woman. It doesn't mean I have to be bored to death first. Bring that barbarian woman over to me. Tannis looked at Merida questioningly. She rose and came over, drawing him to one side. He is Elistan, she said, as if Tannis should know the name. When Tannis didn't respond, she clarified, Elistan, one of the high seekers from Haven. He was much loved and respected by the people, the only one who spoke out against the, this Lord Verminard. But no one listened, not wanting to hear, of course. You speak of him in the past tense, Tannis said. He hasn't dead yet. No, but it won't be long, Merida wiped away a tear. I've seen the wasting sickness before. My own father died of it. There's something inside of him, eating him alive. These last few days he had been half mad with the pain, but that's gone now. The end is very near. Maybe not, Tannis smiled. Goldmoon is a cleric. She can heal him. Perhaps, perhaps not, Merida said skeptically. I wouldn't want to chance it. We shouldn't excite Elliston with false hope. Let him die in peace. Goldmoon, Tannis said as the chieftain's daughter came near, this man wants to meet you. Ignoring Merida, the half-elf led Goldmoon over to Elliston. Goldmoon's face, hard and cold with disappointment and frustration, softened as she saw the man's pitiful condition. Elliston looked up at her, young woman, he said sternly, though his voice was weak. You claim to bring word from ancient gods. If it truly was we humans who turned from them, not the gods who turned from us, as we've always thought, then why have they waited so long to make their presence known? Goldmoon knelt down beside the dying man in silence, thinking how to phrase her answer. Finally, she said, Imagine you are walking through a wood, carrying your most precious possession, a rare and beautiful gem. Suddenly you are attacked by a vicious beast. You drop the gem and run away. When you realize the gem is lost, you are afraid to go back into the woods and search for it. Then someone comes along with another gem. Deep in your heart, you know it is not as valuable as the one you lost, but you are still too frightened to go back to look for the other. Now, does this mean the gem has left the forest, or is it still lying there, shining brightly beneath the leaves and waiting for you to return? Elistan closed his eyes, sighing, his face filled with anguish. Of course the gem waits for our return. What fools we have been. I wish I had time to learn of your gods, he said, reaching out his hand. Goldmoon caught her breath, her face drained until she was nearly as pale as the dying man on the cot. You will be given time, she said softly, taking his hand in hers. Tannis, absorbed in the drama before him, started in alarm when he felt a touch on his arm. He turned around, his hand on his sword, to find Sturm and Karaman standing beside him. What is it? he asked swiftly. The guards? Not yet, Sturm said harshly, but we can expect them any minute. Both Eben and Gilthanus are gone. Night deepened over Pax Tharkas. Back in his lair, the red dragon Pyros had no room to pace, a habit he had fallen into in his human form. He barely had room to spread his wings in this chamber, though it was the largest in the fortress, and had even been expanded to accommodate him. But the ground floor chamber was so narrow, 
All the dragon could do was turn his great body around. Forcing himself to relax, the dragon laid down upon the floor and waited, his eyes on the door. He didn't notice two heads peeking over the railing of a balcony on the third level far above him. There was a scratch on the door. Pyrus raised his head in eager anticipation, then dropped it again with a snarl as two goblins appeared, dragging between them a wretched specimen. Gully dwarf, Pyrus sneered, speaking common to underlings. Verminard's taken leave of his senses if he thinks I need a gully dwarf. Toss him in a corner and get out. He snarled at the goblins who hastened to do as instructed. Seston cowered in the corner, whimpering. Shut up, Pyrus ordered irritably. Perhaps I should just flame you and stop that blubbering. There came another sound at the door, a soft knocking the dragon recognized. His eyes burned red. Enter! A figure came into the lair of the dragon, dressed in a long cloak, a hood covered its face. I have come as you commanded, Ember, the figure said softly. Yes, Pyros replied, his talons scratching the floor. Remove the hood, I would see the faces of those I deal with. The man cast his hood back. Up above the dragon on the third level came a strangled, choking gasp. Pyros stared up at the darkened balcony. He considered flying up to investigate, but the figure interrupted his thought. I have only limited time, royal one. I must return before they suspect, and I should report to Lord Vormenard. In due course, Pyro snapped irritably. What are these fools that you accompany plotting? They plan to free the slaves and lead them in revolt, forcing Verminard to recall the army marching on Qualanesti. That's all. Yes, royal one. Now I must warn the dragon high lord. Bah, what does that matter? I will... It will be I who deal with the slaves if they revolt, unless they have plans for me. No, royal one. They fear you a great deal, as all must, the figure added. They will wait until you and Lord Verminard have flown to Qualanesti. Then they will free the children and escape into the mountains before you return. That seems to be a plan equal to their intelligence. Do not worry about Verminard. I will see he learns of this when I am ready for him to learn of it. Much great ma greater matters are brewing. Much greater. Now listen closely. A prisoner was brought in today by that imbecile toad. Pyros paused, his eyes glowing. His voice dropped to a hissing whisper. It is he, the one we seek. The figure stared in astonishment. Are you certain? Of course, Pyros snarled viciously. I see this man in my dreams. He is here within my grasp when all of Kryn is searching for him. I have found him. You will inform her dark majesty. No, I dare not trust a messenger. I must deliver this man in person. But I cannot leave now. Verminard cannot deal with Qualanesti alone. Even if the war is just a ruse, we must keep up appearances, and the world will be better for the absence of elves anyway. I will take the Everman to the queen when time permits. So why tell me, the figure asked an edge in his voice. Because you must keep him safe, Pyro shifted his great bulk into a more comfortable position. His plans were coming together rapidly now. It is a measure of her dark majesty's power that the cleric of Mishikal and the man of the green gemstone arrive together within my reach. I will allow Verminard the pleasure of dealing with the cleric and her friends tomorrow. In fact, Pyro's eyes gleamed, this may work out quite well. We can remove the green gemstone man in the confusion, and Verminard will know nothing. When the slaves attack, you must find the green gemstone man. Bring him back here and hide him in the lower chambers. When the humans have been destroyed and the army has wiped out Qualanesti, I will deliver him to my dark queen. I understand, the figure bowed again, and my reward will be all you deserve. Now leave me. The man cast the hood up over his head and withdrew. Pyros, folding his wings and curling his great body around with a huge tail up over his snout, he lay staring into the darkness. The only sound that could be heard was Seston's pitiful whine weeping. 
Are you all right? Fizban asked Tasselhoff gently as they sat crouched by the balcony, afraid to move. It was pitch dark, Fizban having overturned a vase on the highly indignant puffball flame. Yes, Tass said dully. I'm afraid, I'm sorry I choked like that. I couldn't help myself. Even though I expected some sort of... It's still hard to realize someone you know could betray you. Do you think the dragon heard me? I couldn't say, Fizban sighed. The question is, what do we do now? I don't know, Taz said miserably. I'm not supposed to be the one that thinks. I just come along for the fun. We can't warn Tannis and the others because we don't know where they are, and if we start and wandering around looking for them, we might get caught and only make things worse. He put his chin in his hands. You know, he said with unusual soberness, I asked my father once who Kenders, why Kenders were little and why... We weren't big as big like humans and elves. I really wanted to be big, he said softly. And for a moment, he was quiet. What did your father say? asked Fizban gently. He said Kenders were small because we weren't meant to do small things. If you look at all the big things in the world closely, he said, you'll see that they're really made up of small things all joined together. That big dragon down there comes to nothing but tiny drops of blood, maybe. It's the small things that make the difference. Very wise, your father. Yes, Taz brushed his hand across his eyes. I hadn't seen him in a long time. The kind pointed chin jutted forward, his lips tightened. His father, if he had seen him, would not have known this small, resolute person for his son. We'll leave the big things to the others, Taz announced finally. They've got Tannis and Sturm and Goldmoon. They'll manage. We'll do the small thing, even if it doesn't seem very important. We're going to rescue Seston.